We didn't get to talk to you after the Miami game with yeah. Clay's Campbell. You got close to to getting one. What what are your thoughts there on on what happened and how can you keep that from happening? No doubt, C certainly unacceptable. Uh, we we take pride in protection. Um, in that certain states, uh, certain case, they were in the their their punt safe look. So um, I think they were only rushing four at that time. So um, end of the day, we got to be more physical, block with more physicality, and, and, and use our hands and, and just do our job. Excuse me. How frustrating is it when you know they could rush for and still potentially get to the punter? Excuse me. Oh, very much so. I mean, yeah. I mean, they rush four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, however many they rush, we got to we got to block those guys. So we got to do a better job. I got to do a better job. Can you take us kind of through the whole situation with the onside kick after the safety and yeah. how that wound up on the ten yard line and, and kind of what you instructed, how you instructed your guys to handle it? Yeah, so in that particular moment, um, the kickoff team has the opportunity in the fourth quarter when you're trailing to declare a regular kickoff or an onside. Um, after safety, they declared another onside kick. So we covered the first one. They come out, they take, they, they got a safety. They come out and they say, hey, we're going to kick another onside. Okay, so um, in that particular moment, they're kicking off from the 20. So they can still use a tee or they can punt it. If they're declaring an onside kick with the punter now, they're going to hit either a drop kick or what we call a moonshot, where he's just going to hit as high as he can and, uh, you know, we got to do, we got to recover it. Um, in that particular moment, uh, you know, Jaquan's back deep at the 25 yards from the, from the tee. And uh, we got to signal a fair catch at that moment. So um, Jaquan's back 25 yards from the spot. And his job is to fair catch the ball. And so I'm losing my mind. I got to do a better job <laughs> controlling my emotions. But um, ball landed outside in that particular moment, the setup zone. Okay, so there's two zones. There's the landing zone, which normal kickoffs is from the 20 to the goal line. When you declare an onside kick, it's the setup zone where the ball has to land, which is 25 yards between the uh, really 15 yards from the uh, where we're set up, 10, which is 10 yards from the, the tee to the uh, 15 yards behind. So he's 25 yards from the spot. So that ball has to land in that setup zone. And so I see the ball go up and it lands and he didn't fair catch it. So I didn't know if it hit anybody, land, uh, landed inside that setup zone. He says, coach, it landed outside the setup zone, which is a penalty, play stops right there. So going forward, we're going to fair catch everything and make sure we, we uh, ensure possession of that ball. So well, he knew if, it was outside the setup zone. Yeah, he, he came right to me and said, coach, it landed outside. I said, Q, great job, but we got to fair catch that thing. So even if you have fair shot, it'll be put on the 10-yard line. Pen penalty, yeah. So it's 15, spot, 15 yards from the spot. Um, and so in that particular moment, because of safety, it was half the diff distance from the 20. Letting it drop was was a fine play. It, it, it was but a fine play, but just cleaning up going forward, we're gonna we're gonna fair catch that. Don't don't even make it close. So I think it landed at the 43 yard line. So any, anything we, we got to we just got to do a better job just securing the catch. If you attempt to fair catch that and muff the catch, is it recoverable by the nope. kicking team? No, nope. it's no it plays what? plays over. Yep. What was I guess bye week like for you as far as self scouting, cleaning some things up, uh, moving forward? Yeah, it was, you know, the, the bye couldn't have came at a better time. Early, early in the year, um, you know, we're not playing our best ball, and we certainly have uh, a lot of room to grow. And so uh, four weeks in, um, you know, I'm excited about the guys we have. You know, we, we have done some good things, but certainly we got to clean up protection, um, you know, really just diving deep into what we're doing, clean up our technique, make sure guys are trusting their technique, and then at the end of the day just playing more physical and just playing with the edge. Um, you know, we talk about grit all the time, just having that passion and per perseverance just to uh, – you know, ultimately reach your goals. And so uh, we're going to continue to get better. And, and, and you know, we got, we got 13 games left. It's early, it's early in the year, and uh, we're excited about what we're about to do. How's Will, I guess, been the star this week for you? He's been good. You know, I think there's, uh, you know, when you're coming off kind of an injury and, you know, the week off was really good for him and finally getting out, getting him out there was our first day Monday. And he threw a little bit, and then yesterday he felt pretty good. So I think there's, you know, I think now he's kind of getting – Confidence and feeling he's more comfortable again after, you know, kind of banging up the shoulder a little bit. But I think that week off kind of came at a good time for him and for all of us. How has he been just as far as the mental side of things after seeing the success the team had without him? And just, yeah. like, is he, is he pressing or what are you doing to keep him from pressing if that's the okay? case? I don't think he's pressing. You know, I think he, being a young player, he really wants to kind of maybe have that moment or that feeling of, all right, like I've taken it over and it's, you know, my team. But I think if you ask the rest of the team, we would say, it's your team, man. Like, I don't think there's, you know, Brian and myself and everybody else, we've made as clear as possible, you know, he's the starter. So I do think 
as a young guy, you do press a little bit. And, you know, I know he's mad at himself for the one interception, which kind of some of the other turnovers we've had in the past, you know, he's, you know, we can be mad about or kind of those things. That one kind of just happens. You know, didn't see the dropping end and he was kind of blocked out by JC. But, you know, he's been good. And I think kind of that week away probably helped, probably helped everybody, you know, helped him too. You saw how the offense was really on schedule. Uh, like there was a third and four later where Rudolph had kind of like the same read and he threw it as opposed to running. Is there something you could do with Will just to make him more on schedule or do you feel that he is on schedule enough? I feel he's on schedule enough. You know, he can always be better, but the thing that we did so well against the Dolphins was we actually stayed on, you know, we had what, nine third and six or lesses, right? So really we were able to finally not be behind the chain. So it gave us a chance to convert and you know, we didn't convert as many as we wanted, but I think with Will, we got to help him give him a chance too of getting in those situations rather than being in third and longs like he'd been in those first three games. Tough to separate the being in those situations for Will versus being in those situations with Will. Like, how much of it was Mason keeping you out of those situations, and how much of it was the other 10 guys? I think everything's a combination. We ran the ball so many times, you know, we really, when we got the lead, we kind of really just kind of stuck to the run game and kind of bled the clock a little bit. And the way the game goes, you know, that's why, you know, there weren't as many targets for people and pass attempts and things like that. And so it was good for us just to kind of, the way the game played out, we had all those runs and we just kind of, I think that more led to it than Will versus Mason. There's a lot of praise for the, for the run blocking out, out of Miami, but the, the stats show that the Tony in particular and Tajay even doing ridiculously good work after, after contact. Yeah. Um, so is it more a testament to what the running backs are doing than, than the run blocking that they're getting? It's a combination, right? So I think those two, we're really lucky to have both those guys, right? They're great after contact and they're great making people miss in space. So the first guy doesn't really ever bring down either one of them. So they get a ton of credit for that. Looking at the game, looking at the defenses we were getting, it was really almost like a four minute drill the whole second half. You know, there was nine, 10 guys in the box and kind of we're in 22 personnel and things like that. So there's going to be an unblocked player if you're, you know, an under center run team, and you're not doing the zone read to buy an extra defender. So there's always going to be an extra guy there. So it just kind of turned out the second half really turned out like a four minute drill when you look back at it. So a, a mixture of both, if that answers the question. With the roster move that was made yesterday to move Leroy to the 53 man roster, what do you need to see going forward for either Leroy or Nick to solve the right tackle question once and for all? There just needs to be a level of consistency and a level of just staying connected to the guy, right? So when you're blocking the D end, right? I feel, you know, Nick had just a couple last two games, really, a couple times where there's just so much space and he's just really kind of not getting any hands on him. You know what I mean? And so really it's who's going to be able to get contact and then sustain contact for both those guys. And today's really the big day. You know, Thursday's our in pads day. So we're going to let them battle it out. And, you know, that we got a couple defensive linemen really keyed up to test them both. And we'll kind of see how it plays out. How much of a confidence boost was it for this offense, especially that offensive line, to not only get the win, but also find success on the ground? I think they all were really happy that especially after the Packers game where we really didn't run at all in the second half. I think we had two or three rushing attempts to go out there, lean on the run game, play with a lead. We, you know, didn't turn it over in the second half or, and really kind of for us to establish a tempo like that, we, you know, Tony had the big run and then the next play we get Tajay makes the guy miss in space. And all of a sudden that's a, for us, I think it's a confidence boost of that's how we want to play. And, you know, playing clean football for us was that I think for the offensive line, for everybody, was probably the best confidence boost for everyone to just go out there, do the simple stuff, and have some success. Miami was a bit of a different situation, just the way that the game played out. But um, looking at Calvin and DeAndre, you guys are paying them a, a ton of money, and they're you know averaging three-ish targets catches a game. Um, outside of that, what's the satisfaction level when you guys as coaches sit down and look at how much you're featuring your highest-paid stars on offense? Uh, not satisfied, to be very honest. You know, the second half of really the Miami game, we, you know, like we said, turned into a four minute drill, kind of took that one out. And then you go to Green Bay, you know, we had some targets lined up for those guys and there was some pass protection issues and quarterback hits. And I know now it feels with the bye, it feels like it was, you know, a month ago, but it wasn't that long ago. So then 
that's really where the start of that lack of production came up. You know, you go back to the Jet game, we're still getting D-Hop going, so he's still kind of on the pitch count and really had targets. He had a couple big plays down the field. So it's really been two games, and I would say it's really been a game and a half. So if you take the Packers game, first half of the Dolphins game, and then the second half to me is a little bit of a wash. But that being said, it's important for us to get the ball to those guys. And you can't win in the NFL by just being a 22 personnel run team, hoping that they don't score. And, you know, we got a great defense and that, but we got to do our part too. And those guys are going to be big factors for us going forward. Any of that impetus on Will, or is it on you guys to scheme up during the week, looks for those guys and just let Will do his job? It's on the coaches. I think it's the coaches. We want to put all those guys, we want to move them around. You know, formationally, we don't just kind of line up in two by two or three by one and just kind of go play and say, ah, oh, the ball goes wherever it goes. We shift and motion and move guys around and try to get guys free access. So it's on the coaches, you know, and then we'll, we just want Will to go through the reads, right? We're not sitting there going, okay, now it's this time uh, DeAndre hasn't gotten a ball. Let's throw it to him no matter what. Uh, well, that's kind of where you get in trouble and all of a sudden he's forcing it to somebody and things like that. That's on the coaches and we got to get those guys more involved and more involved early. You hear a lot about the value of getting receivers in rhythm early, like you just said. Why is that so important? Why is getting them a touch early so important to getting them going late? I think just you know, the feel of the game, right? I think as long as it, the longer it goes, they're just kind of, there's an anxiousness, there's kind of like an unsettledness, and you know, all those guys, they really want to contribute, you know, and I, credit to those guys after Miami, there was no complaining, they were the happiest two guys, you know, in the, in the world, and there's a lot of teams and a lot of cultures where those guys would be not happy that the team won, but you know, or kind of happy that the team won, but more upset that they didn't get their touches and get their targets and things like that, so credit to those guys for, you know, kind of seeing what's going on and we're trying to get it to them and they know the game plan and they know where the ball is supposed to go or hey shoot we're supposed to get to you and we missed this protection so they're not uh, they're both really smart football players in that standpoint so that helps us keep them positive but they they're no different than every other receiver they want the ball and they should get the ball and for us to have success they have to they have to get it Ben in turning the page on his mistakes both in the moment on the sideline and once you watch the film after the fact and, and kind of sort things out. The, the thing with Will is he does, he sees it well. So like, he doesn't come off and say that there's something that didn't happen. You know what I mean? He's always like, I saw him, I didn't see the dropper, or I did see this or those kind of things. So it's like, that's where the communication during the game, it makes, I think it's comforting for us and it's comforting for him of the standpoint of, like I saw it, I just screwed up. You know what I mean? So that's where that level of, he's still, feels confident to me in those things. So he moves on and then I think, you know, Monday afternoon, he's always kind of back to fully in and fully, all right, I, I saw it, we talked about it, we corrected it, move forward. And he's done a good job of, as we're watching tape in the meetings and things like that, being like, all right, that's the look I got fooled on or this is that, or okay, I didn't see this guy last time. So he's got a great recall on that standpoint, but um, he's done a good job. I think any young player, it's the longer you go without having success, it's always going to be harder. But we don't feel like he's been unsuccessful. You know, he was playing fine, had the pick, then gets the scramble, which, you know, he really would have gotten the first down, and then all of a sudden is he's out of the game. So it's uh, it's just important for us to get him in a rhythm and get him going. And then I think kind of all these things will kind of go away, you know. But it's yeah, I think it's on us coaches to do that. On uh, roughly – a little bit more than half of the plays that you guys run on offense, um, and you're averaging like almost a full yard per play more on those plays. So probably a dumb question, but can you explain why you wouldn't use motion as much as humanly possible on offense? We try. We try as much as we can. You know, sometimes there's you just want to let the defense get set, and then you know where they are. The problem with motion is you motion, and they adjust, and they may not be where you thought they were going to be. And so now the picture changes. A, in the pass game for the quarterback, oh, that guy was supposed to – spin down and he doesn't, you know, that a little bit happened to Will on the interception is they brought the, uh, they brought Ramsey off the slot, right? And the safeties normally go that way, but the safety started here. So he thought he's getting that rotation goes out the other way. So anyways, long tangent there, but the motion for some of us stuff, we want it targeted correctly. And then the other thing we love motion is it gets the guy free access. They can't press the motion players. So you get a guy in motion, now all of a sudden he's getting a free release into the defense, and we can do that. So there's pluses and minuses, just you got to decide each play of what am I giving up 
targeting wise or identification wise by using motion. So that's kind of been our really on each play. What's it been like getting Trevor Simeon up to speed and how's he been just in a short time here? You know, true veteran guy, been around. So he's, whether it was in the same kind of language or different, he's got a lot of experience. So he said, you know, he can talk about a concept and be like, oh, we used to call it X, Y, and Z. And now we call it this. And then him having that time in Cincinnati when he was in training camp, uh, what, I think last year, you know, it really helped him kind of pick it up very quickly. So he could go in and operate as a NFL, you know, re replacement quarterback at any point. What are some of the things that Anthony Richardson does that makes him, I guess, harder to game plan for just considering how physical, how physically gifted he is? You know, to me is, is he compares to like when Cam Newton was in the league. You know, he's a big man. I mean, he looks like a DN. He could run, he's strong. You know, he doesn't go down on first contact. And then, obviously, with the arm, he has tremendous arm talent. I mean, he can throw the ball 70 yards, you know. So you have to be able to stop him from running and then also keep a roof over the top of the defense to uh, eliminate the explosive plays. Is it kind of getting tiresome to have to game plan for two quarterbacks basically yeah. every single week? Yeah, I was just laughing about that. Um, it's been, you know, yeah, over the last couple of weeks, it's if this quarterback plays, you know, what is his style of football versus the other? So you kind of ha have to have two different game plans. And, um, you know, I'm kind of used to it right now. So, um, you know, we'll have a game plan for both quarterbacks. Is this week slightly different just in the sense, I mean, love to Willis or, you know, the situation in Miami, it, it feels like the difference between Flacco and Richardson is so drastic. Does it feel different in that preparation? Um, no, it doesn't. It doesn't feel different. I mean, obviously, Joe, he's a Super Bowl winner. I've been around Joe. I know the talent that he that he possesses, uh, the arm talent, his his ability to anticipate. So I mean, it's 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 a challenge because first of all, you don't know which one you're going to get. And one brings the element of running, and one doesn't. Um, and then, but you look at the game last week. Joe kind of took off a couple times, uh, surprising. But um, you know, it, it 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 can be difficult to to game plan both. But we have a process now, and we do our due diligence to go through each uh, situation, each scenario, and uh, have a game plan for, for both quarterbacks. When you have a guy like Richardson, where you got to go plus one either the second level or the secondary, like how much harder does it make to prepare and keep all your rules in place and everything? Yeah, the, the thing is you got to have rules for quarterbacks that run. And, um, you know, we've had those rules put in since day one. It's, it's really sharpening your, your, your tool belt on how to play it. Uh, making sure everybody's on the same page on where they fit, how they fit, where are they in the in the in the count in terms of the run game. But like I say, you know, he's a versatile quarterback and he can throw the ball too. So you have to spend time playing the pass game uh, against him as well. Andre coming off his best game since he's been with you, maybe how encouraging uh, was that? Uh, I said this a few weeks ago. Like everything that we thought he was coming out, he's been showing. And the more and more he plays and when he makes plays, he's getting better and better. His confidence is at an all-time high. Um, you know, he he knows that he still hasn't reached the ceiling of his talent. And the one thing I love about him is every day he works as hard as he can to get better. Like you see him at practice yesterday running to the ball. You know, he takes pride in it now. And, you know, he's lost some weight. And he feels good about himself and the way he's moving, and he's continue to keep losing weight. And we love where he at, where he's at right now. What's your feeling about the pressure you've been able to generate, the numbers you've had to bring to to get it, and and the the balance there? Well, I, I I just think structurally, you know, if if you're sound on defense structurally, good things will happen. Um, you know, over the last couple of weeks, you had to pick your spots on when you bring pressure because of the dynamics of the quarterback. Um, and then, like I said, the preparation there. You know, I, I still think that the guys up front, okay, when we rush and cover, they still can – they're, they're going to be able to get there. And, you know, I told them the other day, it's just like keep, keep hammering a rock, keep hammering a rock, and you keep hammering it, at one point it's going to break. And we have the talent to go, to go get the quarterback with a four-man rush. Um, but when it happens, it's going to happen. And, and just like anything in this league, just like with takeaways, once you get one, they start to roll. Jamal Adams has only had a handful of snaps mm -hmm. since he's been here. 
is that a matter of a health situation with him or is it just uh, still trying to find the right spots to use him in and the right situation? Uh, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously just the right situation at times. Um, he's doing everything he needs to do all right, to prepare to play. Um, last week we got in the game where, you know, the guys were hot, you know. Um, I thought the secondary played their tail off against Miami, and it was just one of them things that just kept riding the horse and, uh, and, and stuck with it. But Jamal's doing everything he needs to do. He's still a talented player, and, you know, we just have to find spots to play him, and then when he gets on the field, keep him on the field consistently. Is there anything that's going to change about what Jeff can do with the elbow? Does it limit him at all, or does he still have his full arsenal? Yeah, Jeff is Jeff's going to be fine. You know, one thing about Jeff, he's a tough guy. Uh, he's not going to let the injury bother him, and he's going to attack. He's going to attack the line of scrimmage like he normally does. He's in a great mood, and I can't wait to see him play. What are your thoughts from uh, Jarvis Brownlee's first action, kind of taking that spot uh, with the absence of a woozy? What did you see from him in that game against the Dolphins? Well, I think I think that Jarvis is growing, just like Tavondre. Um, the more action he gets, he gets better. The one thing that I love, you know, about him playing was his tenacity. You know, he was going up against receivers that are well respected, that are fast, that a lot of people don't go and challenge. And he was up to the he was up to the uh, challenge. He went down. He was pressing. He he was physical rerouting. He stayed on top. He was connected at the top of the routes. And then obviously when you have Legarius Sneed, who's in the room with him, they, they have very similar personalities as players. I think that also helps. And then going on to Sneed, I mean, you know, I, sometimes I don't think he gets the respect that he deserves. I think he's the best corner in the National Football League. And um, he's not afraid of any challenge. He's not afraid of anyone, and I just love to see him compete. What are the challenges of coaching Legarius when he has such a high standard for itself? It seems like he can have a great game and be incredibly critical. Is that something you like or feed into at all? Why not? I mean, it's it's when you have a guy that demands the best out of himself, and he he's self motivated, and he goes out there and tack every rep that he has at practice. He he tacks it like it's a game rep. And for a guy that has been paid and played in his league and he still plays with the tenacity, he still respects the game, the way the game is supposed to be played, how can you not love it? It's easy to coach a guy like that because he wants to be the best and he puts in the work to be the best. So as a coach, man, it's a joy to be around him. You talk about him putting in the work to be the best. I don't know if you saw the clip that was going around of him talking some trash to Tyreek yeah. Hill. Cornerbacks are often known for being out on the island, so they have to have this big thoughts of themselves, and mm -hmm. an, an ego might help. What's that like for you watching him go up against maybe one of the best top three wide receivers in the league and, and talk his talk? The one thing about LeJarrius is no ego. It's not a false bravado. What you see is what he is. He's not afraid to fail, and he's going to compete at the highest level he can compete on a daily basis. It does not matter. To, to me, when I watch him, it's like the guys that he go against are nameless faces. Thank you. I know this is, this is a cr crucial, crucial catch week. I understand you lost your mom. Mm -hmm. uh, how much did she help maybe shape the person you are today? And is that maybe her pendant that you wear? Yeah, around? It's, 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 funny, it's funny you say that. Yeah, you know, the pendant I wear, it represents, it has her initials on it. You know, I wear it every day. Um, my, my mom, she meant the world to me. Uh, losing her at the time five years ago to cancer was 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 hard. Um, you know, I still dedicate everything that I do to her, even before the games. You know, the the number one thing I think about is her first, and the the thing she instilled in me, and it kind of it kind of clears my mind to be able to go out there and coach the team. So my mom was a huge uh, inspiration to me. I miss her every day. Um, love my mom to death, and she's been vital in in who I've become as a man.